Triyata Lakshya Graduate School of Business, Business Roundtable, Episode 4. Today, we are here to discuss the internationalization, modernization, and digital transformation of Caribbean financial systems for growth. Many scholars have noted that for small development economies like us in the region, to stay relevant and achieve growth, we must be able to stay connected to the global financial system. This is indeed important for us to be able to transact financially with the rest of the world, attract foreign capital, and support the building of the financial services sector in the region. It is within this context today that we have brought together a diverse group of experts in the field to discuss the issues pertinent to the internationalization, modernization, and digital transformation of Caribbean financial system. Each panelist will begin with a three to five minutes presentation on a specific area as it relates to the topic, after which there will be a discussion among the panelists. After that discussion, we will discuss issues and questions raised by you, the audience. You are reminded to post your questions to the chat and Q&A forum, and we would entertain as much as possible. Our first panelist is Mr. Mariano Brown, CEO of the Arthur Lockjack Graduate School of Business. Mr. Mariano Brown was appointed the CEO of the Arthur Lockjack Graduate School of Business in September 2020. Mr. Brown holds a BSc degree in economics from the University of the West Indies and an MBA in finance from the University of Wales Manchester Business School. He is a fellow of the Associate of Certified Chartered Accountants and a former Vice President of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Toronto Tobago and Treasurer of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of the Caribbean. He has a long and distinguished career in the local and regional banking sectors and currently sits on a number of local private sector boards. He has served Trinidad Tobago as the Minister of Trade and Industry and Minister in the Ministry of Finance in the government of Trinidad and Tobago from 2007 to 2010. Prior to his appointment as a minister, he spent most of his time in the financial services sector in the region. Immediately before assuming office, he was managing director of the Butterfield Bank for four years and CEO of Caribbean Commercial Bank Limited for 11 years, both of which were in Barbados. He has also held senior management position at Republic Bank and is a founding principal of an investment bank in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Brown writes regularly on matters of banking and in finance, matters in the re financial matters in the region, and has presented several papers at international conferences. Mr. Brown has been a member of the school's adjunct faculty since 2014. Today, he will set the stage by briefly describing the key elements and systems in the modern day financial system. Over to you, Mr. Brown. Um, well, thank you very much for that long introduction. I thought we had gotten it down. Um, <clears throat> well, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to um, deal with some of these matters, uh, if only because uh, it's, it's formed a major part of my life, um, working life, and a major part of my professional life as well. Uh, a financial system essentially is made up of all the financial services firms um, that deal with the issue of money as a medium of payment, as a, 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 as a store of value, um, as a form of investment or speculation, if you will, and a precautionary motive. Invariably, we've tended to look at the financial system only from the perspective of banks. But I think as the liberalization has taken place, um, starting well in North America and following literally across the globe, that the financial system has, um, has become and has been part of and considered in its widest perspective to include all those financial services firms that deal with the issue of payments and payments of money. And that includes the insurance companies, includes banks, it includes stock exchanges, and anything that facilitates the movement, if you will, of funds. So the financial system is a much wider set of institutions. Uh, and we, whilst we broadly distinguish between banks and non-banks, uh, in the literature we've begun, we've started to call them financial services firms um, because the lines between them are becoming increasingly blurred in terms of who does what and how. So <clears throat> the task that they facilitate essentially is to link what we call um, savers with borrowers. Uh, in the language, we call them deficit spenders. It's a nice term, but really and truly savers and borrowers, and all the various mechanisms through which money is saved. And uh, 
we always thought of a financial system as dealing with what you would consider to be the movement of money. Now we've broadened it to mean a payments system. And by a payment system, we mean the mechanisms which facilitate the transfer of value across those various, if you want, players. Um, the individuals, the firms, the businesses who make up that market. And in more sophisticated markets, um, the uh, corporate structures are literally acti are active in the market as direct borrowers in their own right. Um, that's what we call the corporate bond market. And that's facilitated. And that's one of the reasons for the growth of what we consider to be the international rating agencies, Moody's, Standards & Poor's, Fitch. Because if by if where we had a small number of players, we knew who they were, we knew who the banks were. Once we started to move out and corporations started to issue, if you want, loans uh, in their own right and loan instruments and debt certificates in their own right, they simply broaden the field. Therefore, we had to find a mechanism to determine um, how, what is the credit rating? What is the strength of those institutions? So that in its widest possible uh, meaning, its definition, a financial system incorporates all of those entities. Now, that's when we're looking at a country and we know how to look at it, uh, especially since globalization uh, has taken off. Uh, what and how does the international payment system function? By definition, what is the international payment system? It is a system or method which allows and functions and facilitates and joins, literally, all of those institutions that operate in individual countries to be able to transfer value. I, and I use the term value as distinct from money. Money can take place in many forms. So, for example, we have all different forms of electronic transfer mechanisms now. Uh, it's not just simply um, that we are wiring money from point A to B, which is traditionally the role of banks that the banks would literally organize a payment for trade uh, across national boundaries and across different currencies. And that is what the international payment system refers to. It refers to the payment of money for transactions purposes, right, trade, right? It, it, it facilitates the transfer of money for speculative purposes, investment, loans, borrowing, um, as well as, and the other motives that go with that as a store value. How do we store our money? How do we keep our money? What currencies do we keep our money in? Where do we keep it? Which institutions? In what form? And of course, all of that has now been facilitated um, by the development of electronic transfer mechanisms. So we know that we could pay with cash. We know we could pay with checks. Those are the traditional instruments. But we also know that we could also settle with credit cards, debit cards, and there are also various mechanism, mechanisms for what we consider to be electronic funds transfer. Right? So that it becomes uh, a wide spectrum of settlement devices, uh, some of which are more important than others to facilitate commerce, some of which are also more important than others to facilitate uh, investment. So, for example, um, we also have the electronic clearinghouse mechanisms to facilitate the movement of bonds. So in the old days, we used to think of bonds as paper certificates. Right? Yeah, now bonds come in electronic format. And the two largest clearinghouses in the world that deal with that are Euroclear and Sedel. So literally, it's what is the QCIP number? All right. And then if we continue on from that, we've also had the development of other um, strategies or techniques, uh, which we have got associated with the things called cryptocurrencies, which themselves threaten to make the situation even a little bit more complicated. What is important, all of this? Trust, confidence, right? without which no transaction can take place. All right? so that, that underlies the value of a currency. It underlies the value of an instrument. It underlies the value of the institutions which take place in this particular market. So that the bottom line is that now we have a complicated system, not only of domestic payments, but also of an international payments mechanism. What we want to ensure, what one wants to ensure is that they have confidence in the system, that my money will move from point A to B, and I can be certain that it will get there, and that they won't charge me too much money. And that's the argument that's generally been used against the, against the financial services firms, which we call banks, that they're expensive. So that is the system in, in, in a whole, um, contains a lot of moving parts, a lot of pieces, and literally what it requires is clear, transaction mechanisms which are transparent, uh, which ensure 
that movement of funds, movement of value, movement of savings move from point A to B and that we can rest secure in the knowledge that the transactions will take place with 100% confidence limit, not a 99% confidence limit, 100% confidence limit. That's what you're looking for. Another in a nutshell is literally what the international financial system is about. It is about how our domestic systems integrate with the payment structures across countries and across the world. And that's what we've come to know as the international financial mechanism. And of course, on the outside of that, we have the other international devices which don't participate in the commercial market per se, but are important in the sense of maintaining the confidence in those particular structures. Um, the key and the apogee institution, of course, and all of that is the Bank for International Settlements, uh, in, in which is headquarters in Switzerland, and that's one. And on the other side, um, of course, that's the, the central bank of all central banks. In other words, payment mechanisms have to have um, some security, some strength, Right, and that's the central banks we essentially gather under the umbrella of the Bank for International Settlements. And of course, on the other side of the fence, from a country perspective, to make certain that countries' payment systems work and work well, we have the IMF on the other side. Now, that is the architecture. All right. <clears throat> and what we're here today to discuss is some of the changes, how that architecture is evolving, developing, and uh, what are the changes we can expect to see and what are the developments that are important for, trade, for, the, for the Caribbean as a whole. Thank you very much. So thank you, Mr. Brown, for so eloquently setting the stage by walking us through our modern-day financial system and the importance of clarity, trust, and confidence in our system. So now that we have that in perspective, our second speaker is Dr. Michel Salandi, Manager Financial Management Services at TTIFC. Dr. Michel Salandi is responsible for driving the development of the financial services sector ecosystem with a special focus on strengthening the public financial management system and adoption of cashless and future-ready financial services technology applications and system. She has several years of experience conducting in-depth research, performing quantitative analysis and presenting economic concepts. A previous undertaking of analytical research paper has also led to publications in the Journal of Economics and International Finance, the Journal of Development Areas, and the Journal of Eastern Caribbean Studies. Today, she will be discussing digital financial technologies of the future and the extent to which these can be considered disruptive in nature as opposed to just fostering incremental change. Over to you, Dr. Salandi. Hi again, good day everyone. It's really good to be here. I'm following up from the last you know, speaker. It's really, really setting that wider set of institutions, you know, that really resonates again. Because I think as we look at the past, you know, we look at understanding the current and looking toward the future, what I really see is, and I think we can agree on, is that the advent of the fourth industrial revolution is really spurring that modernization and digital transformation within the financial sector. So, you know, as he said, that wider set of institutions really is coming about by, as we witness, you know, this new and deeper evolution of the financial landscape. And that's really occurring through several key components. I know we like to see the, say the ABCs of FinTech, you know, the artificial intelligence, blockchain, you know, cloud computing. Um, those are some of the things that we think of. But in today's world, we're also seeing that infrastructural exchange, you know, moving from what we see as a brick and mortar location to more mobile online connections for most of our financial services. And I think one of the areas that will even propel this further is coming out of COVID-19. And as we know, during this time, consumers are demanding, you know, that increased digitization, that increased need for 24-7, 365 day access. So what I see now, especially within the Caribbean coming out of this is that we will have this demand for anywhere, anytime service. So as we build on this, I think the continued evolution will happen in several areas. One, um, which was mentioned before, which is the reshaping of the payment space. I think really we are seeing that impetus for a cashless future. And when we say cashless, it doesn't mean that cash is not going to have any value or we will not see coins or notes, but it's really to ensure that we're going to have more digital options for payments. So as we're seeing, you know, moving from mobile wallets, e-money, 
um, decentralized cryptocurrency moving on the fact that blockchain has brought a lot of benefits. We're now seeing things like central bank digital currencies. We are seeing how, when, where we make payments. You know, you're seeing changes in that. And I think as the future progresses, uh, the question will be not just from whom, but you know, what platform we're going to utilize to make payments. As we are seeing today, so many fintech companies within the Caribbean actually selling their services. Um, and that's going to allow us to have options um, in terms of e-commerce, in terms of platforms, what we're going to utilize. So coming on of those from those platforms, we're also seeing this abandonment of the us versus them. You know, at the beginning, we say we have disruptors. We're seeing that move to sophisticated partnerships, even within our Caribbean ecosystem, where fintechs and the, the original banks themselves that we, we know today, um, they are now merging to really give us um, a new financial ecosystem with new players. I think as well, you know, you're hearing the data is the new oil for Trinidad and Tobago. You're seeing that move to a data-centric approach. And I think as that continues, um, we're going to have a greater use of advanced credit scoring methods and so forth, which will move us past conventional means to grant credits. We're going to see you know, probably greater utilization of insure tech in our insurance sectors, where motor and health insurance now can be based more so on the employ of usage-based telematics which will allow us to continue to achieve cost efficiencies and product democratization. I think another area, um, as we look toward the future, is this possible consensus of moving or transforming what we think or what we consider to be a traditional bank, a traditional insurance sector. And I think if we look at it as consumers today, we are seeing it, right? We are seeing Amazon, we are seeing Facebook, we're seeing Google, we're seeing Apple offering payment wallets. So in the West, you know, we like to give them that collective term of GAFA. In the East, we are seeing a collective term of BAT, you know, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Um, I think in the Caribbean, very soon, we may have our own acronym as we are having more players here. You know, you have the, the WePay, you had M-Pesa, I think in Kenya, you know. There are a lot more providers outside of the conventional service providers that we see. And I believe elements of open banking, the use of application programming interfaces, which will continuously link financial service providers um, uh, to other traditional institutions will continue to lower barriers, allow us to share data, allow us to improve, allow us to expand our concept of what we think financial services is, how we think we can make financial payments, how we can make investors. Um, or make investments and by whom. Uh, and as I wrap up in this area, I think we see embedded finance, we see banking as a service, and it comes back to what we said, you know, trust is going to be that, trust is actually going to be the trust forward because as we build more trust in the systems that we see, um, I think people will move to see in banking as a service, as non-financial or digital platforms or so will start to seamlessly integrate financial services. So similar to taking an Uber and you know basically at the end of your ride, um, you'd realize that your payment is already seamlessly done. I think we expect to see more things like that on the market. And I mean, I can't end without really touching on cybersecurity. And I think the way we also employ technology to ensure that we minimize any potential risks while maximizing on the benefits that we're going to see coming out of fintech, I think there's going to be a role for reg tech, regulation technology, anti-money laundering systems, the use of AI and machine learning to really track and prevent fraud. So I, I really see a holistic change within our market as we really expand our services. Thank you. Thank you for that, Michelle. And so we have a sense of where we are present. We have a sense of where we are going in the future. So let's now get to a man who lives in the present. So our next speaker is Mr. Gregory Hill. So Mr. Gregory Nicholas Hill is a career banker, has earned a notable reputation in the regional financial services industry spanning over 25 years in all aspects of banking and capital markets having executed over $60 billion in transaction in multiple jurisdictions. Mr. Hill is a managing director of ANSA Merchant Bank Limited, 
and the chairman of Consolidated Finance Company Limited in Barbados. As managing director, he has led the bank into the regional capital market spotlight with several high-profile transactions putting the bank in the top quartile of the industry. Prior to this, Mr. Hill has ex held executive position at regional financial institutions where his responsibility included head of investment banking in the Caribbean, head of banking for regional banking subsidiaries, and domestically in corporate banking and regulation. Mr. Hill is a director and past president of the Securities Dealers Association of Trinidad and Tobago, vice president of the American Chamber of Commerce of Trinidad and Tobago, and a member of the Accountants for Business Global ACCA Forum. Mr. Hill graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Economics and with honors from the University of the West Indies and a fellow of the Association of Chartered Accountants of FCCA and a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Trinidad and Tobago. He has graduated as top MBA student in 2004 from the Arthur Lockjack Graduate School of Business with an executive MBA and is currently chairman of the board of the Alumni Association. Today, he is going to speak to opportunities and challenges in future global digital financial world. Over to you, Mr. Hill. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is indeed my pleasure to join this very esteemed panel on this particular topic today. Um, you know, on the, the subject of digitization of the financial systems and the opportunities for uh, commerce and business, um, you know, my, my view is that, you know, especially with retail financial products such as banking and insurance, I expect to see a major shift towards digitization uh, of these products, um, what I call commoditization as well where the products will be available through multiple channels from multiple organizations, not through the traditional organizations only. And, and these products and services will be delivered through new channels. Uh, they will be uh, competitive based on price, but customers will also have the ability to customize uh, the type of offering that they want. They'll be able to plug and play and, and choose uh, their products uh, such as a subscription type of model. So this is where we are, we're going to go. The customer is going to get a lot more power, uh, a lot more use of artificial intelligence, a lot more use of blockchain. And uh, it's going to be like ordering a, a pizza from Domino's where you could put together the pizza that you want with all the ingredients that you want and come up with a price that you are comfortable with. And, and like Domino's would add on a Sprite or a, a Coca-Cola to the order, you know, there'll be partnerships that uh, the banks will, will team up with to create an ecosystem to ensure that the experience is a seamless one. And I think that that same application is gonna take place in financial services. So that's, that's, what, that's what's gonna be, be happening in the, in the near future. And um, you know, we need to be uh, geared up and prepared to accommodate that type of, uh, of open e-commerce system. Today, I know you all would have expected me to speak purely about banking, but I, I wanna just shift the conversation really quickly. I, but to get a couple slides, uh, just to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what opportunity is there for, for the application um, of, of that, um, that 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 new space that that we're playing in, uh, and you know, I've come up with four four principal pillars. You know, uh, finding your market is the first one. You know, you need to define what your market is. You know, the size of it, who you're targeting, the dollar value, and then then look towards. Um, uh, crafting a product and service that, that fits the market that you want. As you first say, now this applies to banks, financial services, or you know, any industry. Uh, the next item, we spoke a little bit about data earlier. Data is the, is, is the new, new key, and, and some said earlier that is oil is like oil. Uh, getting actionable data that you can analyze, uh, segment the market, understand buying and spending power, where is capital flowing, where, 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 where the customer is, is trends are going that direction. So you need to analyze that as well to come up with what would be your value proposition. And then look, look to find partnerships that will help you provide a seamless experience to the customer, now, be it banking, teaming up with insurance and, and others, other type of financial products and services um, or in other sectors. Uh, it's important to, to, that the ecosystem become expanded to ensure a more seamless experience for customers because that's what customers are gonna be demanding in the future. And lastly, uh, what ties it all together is a way of communicating. You know, um, trade started with barter, and we're going back in that direction where there'll be 
uh, a way of exchanging value uh, amongst participants, uh, players in the ecosystem and with the customer and the end users. And so therefore, um, those four pillars need to be addressed to be able to really see a, a transformation and a digitization of, of business. Uh, if we look at, now I know most of you all are expecting me to speak today about um, uh, uh, banking, but I wanted to just pivot a little bit. I mean, uh, the Car we're part of the Caribbean region and one of the biggest uh, sectors that has been impacted materially by the pandemic is the tourism sector and our brothers and sisters in the region um, and Tobago, uh, you know, make a livelihood of our tourism. So how can we take uh, the transformation of the this particular payments platform, the uh, the economy, what's happening globally with digitization? How can we transform that to impact a sector that's impacting most of the Caribbean? If you look at if you look at the size of the market, Airbnb, thirty-eight billion dollar market, the Caribbean being thirty-four billion dollars. Now, a large part of that uh, revenue does not reside in the Caribbean. So there's an opportunity to be able to, to take some uh, of the digitization taking place, the new payment platforms, the new ecosystems, and the data that we have, combine that and try to uh, create channels to, to, to bring some of that GDP up to home, um, put it into the hands of the, uh, of the small uh, tourism uh, player, as well as the governments and the hotels in, in, the, in the region. And therefore, there's a great opportunity. And so rather than just have a theoretical discussion around it, I wanted to you know, step out of my crease a little bit and just put out an idea um, just to give you a real life example of how of what the future could look like combining banking with, with um, a tourism sector, for instance. So what I've fondly called um, a PanCoin app, uh, you, I mean, most of you would have heard of Bitcoin and all the other coins. Why not PanCoin? I mean, this, this will be a way of digitizing a traditional Caribbean tourism experience by creating a, a platform that all customers, uh, all tourists coming into the region would be able to sign up and participate and be able to be able to pay for products and services. So the PanCoin wallet uh, basically be a one-stop shop for the, the Caribbean experience. The, the idea behind it, you know, we get all the Caribbean uh, mobile networks to push notifications to anyone entering our airspace to download the PanCoin app. And what, what is an incentive? As you land, you get Wi-Fi. In whatever, hood, whatever airport that you land in, you get access to Wi-Fi via the app. So you sort of push the, 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 the traveler onto our platform. And this is the Caribbean platform, right? Uh, so PanCoin, the idea is that this wallet will be uh, recognized and accepted by all major partners, uh, from hotels to restaurants to taxis, et cetera, across the, all the Caribbean islands. And um, it would store a digital passport, digital ID, as well as your COVID-19 pass. All the data will be stored in blockchain to ensure that it, it's, a, it's a secure repository for the data. And the app will integrate with all of the, the, the experiences that a typical tourism uh, guest would expect and, uh, and create a seamless experience. And as, and as the application of the, the theory of data and, 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 and payments, uh, how it works? I mean, you must have a custodial bank, you know, which will, you know, interface with the, the bank that's issuing the credit card or the bank account. And, and that custodial bank will then allow for the purchase of digital currencies. Um, and the custody bank will then allow and facilitate the transfer from, you know, fiat to digital, digital to digital, digital to fiat, uh, to be able to exchange the, uh, the traditional currency into the digital, into the digital currency. Now, many of the regional central banks are talking about digitizing their local currency and creating digital fiat. And this is an opportunity to, to have uh, 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 the, 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 you know, the forefathers spoke about the CSME and CARICOM and having a common currency. Um, so they weren't able to achieve it. But you know, using something like PanCoin for the Caribbean, it will allow for a digital exchange of value uh, amongst all of the islands. If you're traveling in Barbados, Trinidad, uh, Jamaica, as the case may be, or Grenada, you're able to purchase goods and services using the app across, across the region. And behind it all will be a digital form of exchange between the digital currencies as well as hard currencies um, using, using the, uh, the, the technology as well as using um, the interfaces with the market. So uh, basically, I mean, the application of it from an a, a end user perspective, which is where we need to go because if the end user is not enjoying it, then it's just going to be a theoretical model. I mean, so the customer using their phone must be able to get benefits out of it. This is where the ecosystem comes in. 
you know, booking your, your spa appointment, your hotel, your, your cruise ship trip, your, you know, your, whatever it is, whatever service that you're looking to, to order, you know, the Caribbean takes control of the data and the customer experience. And so we become the Expedia, the Airbnb, the trip advisor for our region once you enter our airspace. And that's by controlling the data, controlling the experience, and also managing the payments within our own architecture. And that is, I mean, that is going to be a tremendous change in the way we, we interact with our customer experience. Going forward, I mean, if you look at um, uh, booking a restaurant appointment, um, you know, ordering a meal prior to arriving, uh, offering last minute deals and specials to anybody in the app, you can have businesses, small entrepreneurs, SMEs as well, advertising on the app and offering. And customers then have a, da- a massive database to pick which restaurants are highly rated by past customers who has specials on today. Um, you know, and, and that, that level of transparency of data will certainly allow for rating of the quality. And that, will, that that's a definite way of raising the standard of customer service uh, across the Caribbean so that when they enter our airspace, they expect a unique experience of a high standard that uh, is consistent and, and easily easily tracked. And that data will then help us to refine and define um, you know, how we improve our, uh, our customer offering. So it's a, it's a feedback, feedback loop as well. I mean, one example is to have all taxi drivers in the Caribbean use this app for payment. So we become a regional version of, of Uber, but all of a sudden now the pricing is transparent. You know how many coins, how many pound coins you need if you're traveling from the airport to, to Bridgetown or to Port of Spain, you know, you have the coins, you, could, you know, the pricing is transparent. Um, you don't need to go on and use cash, it's safer experience. Uh, you can rate the driver, um, you know, and, and, and you, instead of having it swipe the credit card and, and have part of that cost be um, caught up in the transaction and the currency exchange between the issuing bank in the US or the UK, the conversion rate that they use, instead, uh, using the app, they allow for a much tighter spread, tighter margin, much faster conversion. And uh, that savings to the customer, I mean, it could you could afford to, to, to have a, a night at movie town uh, by the savings uh, by just a taxi, taxi driver trip alone. So the customer is going to be able to get value. And, you know, it's going to put the Caribbean in a different space to be able to compete with, with the rest of the, rest of the market. You know, and, and of course, um, the whole thing is the whole ecosystem is driven behind the back office, which is the payments, the seamless conversion from hard currency into the coins, the ubiquitous exchange and use of it for products and services in the market, and then the exit of it thereafter. So the experience of the customer is easy. You arrive at the restaurant, everything's paid for in advance. You know the quality of the restaurant. You have ordered your menu. You, you have your you have your, your drinks delivered to you. Your, your bills are, are organized. You have a, a calendar assistant to help manage your calendar and show you what specials are available, what time of the day. And, and really, then it, it becomes up to the, re, the, the regulators, the, the private sector, uh, to take the risk of, the, of designing and developing uh, these tools to be able to create a different experience. Now, I know most of you all would have expected me to, to go the, the route of capital markets or banking or payments, but this is the real application of it because I, I have participated in some of these discussions and I do find there's a, a lot of a theory behind it, but you know, as we widen the imagination, uh, it, it really sets sets the uh, the stage for for everyone to be able to apply apply the knowledge. And of course, you know, uh, a couple takeaways would be blockchain technology, scalability. The regulatory bodies need to facilitate the development through sandboxes, digital systems that would afford artificial intelligence. Uh, so these are some of the uh, the concluding pillars at the back end to create the, the, the environment. So I just I just wanted to share that with with everyone today and give you a, a taste of what the future could look like. And I hope you enjoyed it. Hey, thank you very much. And I must say, um, I'm happy that you went out of the comfort zone a bit, there because I think this is something very exciting, and I'm sure we would discuss this some more. You know, in 1967, Thomas and Brewster wrote a piece, "The Dynamics of Caribbean Integration," in which they said. The Caribbean can only integrate if we start at the base, functional and sectorial cooperation. And I think that this idea of the pine coin speaks directly to that. So let's get to our final panelist this morning. And that is Mr. John Aldridge, who is the Chief Executive Officer of TTIFC. Mr. John Aldridge joined the TTIFC as CEO in August 2021. 
He is responsible for leading the company as it executes its mandate of driving digital financial services adoption across all sectors of Trinidad and Tobago and can maintain this position in the financial hub of the region and become a premier location for fintech-enabled services. Mr. Outridge has over 10 years of senior management experience and has supported both public and private sector institutions with strategic guidance on fintech strategies as well as the modernization of public financial management systems for various governments throughout the region. He brings a wealth of experience in the area of digital transformation, payment systems, and electronic fund transfer implementation, strategy and operational modeling designed for state enterprise and financial services organization, fintech, neobanking strategies, and electronic funds transfer payment policy and development. He holds a master's of small and medium enterprise management with distinction from the Arthur Lockjaw Graduate School of Business and lectures on programs related to digital and technological management from the University of the University of Bedfordshire. John is a deputy chair of the American Chamber of Commerce Digital Transformation Subcommittee focused on supporting national policy development for Trinidad and Tobago as it relates to enabling technology to facilitate both the ease of doing business as well as enhancing citizens' service delivery. Today, he would be discussing, as it relates to the TTIFC, how is the TTIFC preparing to take TT, Trinidad and Tobago, into the financial future and stay connected with the rest of the world? Over to you, John. Hi, and good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you, Gregory, for that lovely answer, product placement. I'm feeling far Carib all of a sudden. <laughs> So I, I think the, the conversation is shaping up nicely and my piece really kind of fits in because, you know, what we saw from before really are the sort of possibilities and opportunities, right? So this is what exists in the world today. The question is, you know, and I'm taking it from a broader Caribbean context and then bringing it back to Trinidad and Tobago, what the IFC is really set up to do is how do we get there and where to start? What are the real building blocks that we need to follow to get to this state of euphoria, you know? Because the fact of the matter is, you know, in the Caribbean and even in Trinidad, few people and small businesses fully participate in what we call the formal financial system, right? Those persons in the informal economy, you know, they, 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 come in, they basically transact exclusively in cash. They don't have any safe way of saving or investing money. They have limited or no ability to access credit. And, only through the you know, areas of informal lenders and personal networks, right? As we would have seen in recent times, you know, persons putting money in you know, unregulated schemes and so forth. So, and even those who are even part of the financial system now, you know, they have limited product choices available to them, right? Um, and again, as Gregory was mentioning, you know, all, all of these bundling services and so forth, you know, we are now on the cusp of evolving that, but the fact of the matter is, this is the current state and this is what we have to deal with, right? Because we do have a very high proliferation of persons who are not within the, the sector and who do not participate in the sector. So, you know, speaking from the IFC's mandate, right? And again, you know, where we are, we are trying to basically lead it on two fronts, right? So we are working on digitalization of payments within the government sector, but obviously from that perspective, really trying to now establish Trinidad and Tobago as a fintech enable hub by the year 2023. Now, to do any of that, you really have sort of three foundational elements that or approaches that you would find emerging markets such as ours need to follow, right? And the first one, and, and Mariano mentioned it, first and foremost up front is really about the trust and the confidence within the sector, right? And that speaks a lot to financial inclusion and literacy. And it is something that has really been underdeveloped and has only recently come to the foray where, you know, you, you need to look at the various segments in the population. You need to understand their needs and you need to have a sort of assessment in terms of how do we develop a roadmap to serve them, right? And if you look at that and you break it down into sort of four building blocks, and I'm drawing a parallel to what we have in Trinidad, right, in terms of starting that financial inclusion, right, you know, and developing the whole fintech ecosystem, one of the first things you need to do is, you know, you acknowledge the existence of what we call these EMIs or electronic money issuers, right? And you would have seen the central bank recently in, in Trinidad, you know, would have passed um, legislation back in 2020 to allow for that. So, you know, open the sector, right? 
You also need to basically sort of look outside of the branches, look outside of the bank networks, right? Start to leverage agents and so forth. Um, and you would have seen these sort of perforations of services happening in, in Kenya with, with and Africa and MPSA. And you're basically leveraging um, different um, agents and so forth, right? To, to treat with the informal economy. A next big area, and again, it's something that regionally is kind of taking the forefront is, you know, particularly to support the banks is really from a risk-based approach for KYC and EML, right? And we, we would see that as a, a sort of common issue in terms of COVID-19, basically, as Gregory kind of mentioned, really taking a toll on the Caribbean because we have a very large tourism sector and the government really wanting to support those various businesses and so forth. But, you know, a lot of the businesses are within the small and medium enterprise category, you know, they may not have access to audited financials, they may not have all of the robustness and the documentation and so forth. But again, you know, the regulations prescribe that you need to have that. So again, it's it's really following that sort of model, right? And then tying all that together is really about, you know, the consumer protection, the education aspect, you know, so, and, and Michelle touched on it, right? So as we are trying to push these new digital services and we are now trying to basically modernize the payment infrastructure and so forth, right? How do we ensure that we have people, not only from a financial inclusion, but from a digital inclusion standpoint, that can actually access these systems, that understand the technology, you know, have mobile devices, have data, have proper internet, and, and also understand what does it mean in terms of these various products and services. Uh, the second big component, again, goes back from the, the role of government, right? And, and in terms of this is one of the focus areas the IRC is taking on, and you would see from a number of Caribbean countries, it's, it's a big focus area. How do you digitalize, sorry, digitalize payments within the government? How do you allow citizens to transact with you using these EFT methods and so forth, right? And again, that, that spans three core foundational elements, right? So again, having the transaction mechanisms, having the various EFT methods, which we have been seeing and we have been understanding. You have all of these new FinTech providers providing those capabilities. You know, we, we have basically sort of modernized from links. We have online credit card. We have voucher top up and slowly and surely you'll have different sort of mechanisms being sort of developed and implemented into the infrastructure, right? And it's all about reducing friction, yeah? And then the other big part about that is basically identity, right? So having electronic identity, and that really supports with the risk-based approach, right? So that it gives comfort to know that I understand who I am doing business with. So, and, and this is something that has, you know, again, a lot of Caribbean territories, even our, ourselves, you know, from Trinidad and Tobago, we are pursuing the route to electronic identify, identification for citizens. And again, as you can see, that will play a huge role in uplifting the proliferation of these services, right? And then the systems, right? So again, having the systems, having the infrastructure to support all of this, right? So the, the modernization of ECH and RTGS and all of this payment infrastructure, which when I look locally and I look internally from what we have done in Trinidad, you know, I realize that we have done a lot of the foundational elements in terms of positioning us for very, very rapid growth. It's now all about really executing, really defining that roadmap and executing in a, a very comprehensive manner. And the, the, the last point I would sort of break up from what I was mentioning, it's really about when we look at the financial services sector and to the point of where we want to get around to be able to be a sort of hub by the year 2023, the needs of financial services companies have changed. It's no longer about back office processing and it's no longer about you know, accounting skills. It's really about technology. Financial services companies are the largest consumer of technology talent, bar none. And this is happening globally. And you would see that change happening regionally and even locally. COVID has really sort of accelerated the need for these companies to now say, you know, I need to be able to be more resilient to offer services to my customers. I can't afford to be one something to happen to shut down and I can't operate. I need to be able to facilitate work from home. I need to be able to have online onboarding for customers. I need for, to be able to get connected with them. And the types of skills and persons who are basically uplifting that are the same technology skills you would find in the broader industry, your business analysts, your data engineers, your developers, right? The data scientists. And these are the sort of rules you see now playing or taking a huge part in these industries, right? And, and as I closed off, it really sort of boils down to the three components, right? In terms of how do we 
really map this together and be able to sort of take advantage of these opportunities that are in front of us, right? So again, it's making sure we have the access to the talent and being able to incubate that talent and leverage it, right? It's being able to then use the opportunity that we have right now, start to convert the cash in the system, start to leverage these fintech solutions, start to modernize the payment infrastructure, start to now promote more online transactions. And to that point, security about it. So that creates opportunity within itself. And then that in itself will sort of create the network effect locally, right? Because now, now all of a sudden, Trinidad is now this booming ecosystem where we have this huge opportunity. We have a lot of cash that is running through our system. We have a society that wants to be a part of it. We have some impetus in terms of digitizing this. So it, it creates that cycle. John? Yeah. It does? Okay, thank you. And thank you all for your contribution, initial contribution. Let me try to put this in some context. So we started by looking at what the field is presently. And then we hear some of the ideas uh, in terms of future. And we get a very succinct idea of what could the future look like with fan coins. And that must operate within a space, uh, that being the regulatory uh, environment. So we must you know, set the playing field, but we must have the empires and, and, and set the ring friends there. But let's just start, uh, bring it back to our original and core topic, which is international modernization and digital transformation of Caribbean economy. There's no secret we have been trying this for over 15, 20 years. Um, while we have seen some success, uh, we still have a long way to go. So I want to throw it out to the panel starting with Mr. Brown. What do you see as some of the major hurdles in us getting to that space where, you know, of a, a modern financial system? Your mic is off. I think we have to start off with an intelligent interpretation of some of the financial rules. Uh, if we look at um, particularly anti-money laundering techniques which have been put into position as part of um, factor over the last 10 to 12 years, they have been hugely irrelevant and inconsequential, but they've also created a lot of problems in terms of how we do business. Um, just simply opening accounts, moving, um, going from bank A to B, B um, setting up company A or company Y, um, which just created obstacles. Um, if you were to do the same thing or try to open an account in the US or the UK, you'll find it's a lot easier to do so. Um, does that mean to say that we have a lot more money laundering in the Caribbean than we have in the US? Absolutely not. Um, <clears throat> particularly in the money laundering with regard to, to a huge amount of currencies. The place where you money launder is where there's a lot of money, not where there's a little bit. So uh, it, it, it has, we have to, the, the plan of action and the method in which we have um, started to, 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 to follow through with some of those efforts are not dovetailed. So we have to, we have to make the, the system sensible. We talk about the ease of doing business all the time. Um, but we have to actually walk through the steps. How do we build in compliance and at the same token, not make business more difficult? Because um, I think that's all we've managed to do. Um, if we look at any successful prosecution for money laundering, the answer is zero. After 10 years, zero. So uh, it has to be the way it has been put into position. Um, and we have, to, we have to be more proactive in terms of how we do so. How do we use the electronic mechanisms to give us the sort of information scan and information bias that will facilitate um, true investigations rather than any paper-based formats in which we have done? The second part of that has to do with, I think that the banks are, are coming around. Um, unfortunately, um, the, in, in many instances, some of our banking sector are roughly, um, or they're about 20 years behind the eight ball. Um, uh, and I, I kid you not in that regard, um, in terms of digitizing and allowing transfer payment mechanisms to be adopted. Um, we've, we've pursued and continued with the use of um, the local um, switches, um, which were obsolete by the time when they were initially started. This is Lynx, Kairos, and Barbados. In fact, Barbados, I think, has come to the position where they will put Kairos to bed. Um, <clears throat> some governments have been a little bit more uh, upfront in terms of how they have brought in the digital payments mechanism. Barbados, for example, accepts um, tax payments, um, uh, payments with regard to your expenses and so on, electronically. Um, Trinidad is kind of inching towards it. Jamaica has moved a lot further along the line. So we've had uh, a huge amount of inconsistencies in terms of how the, the, 
the systems, the modalities have been brought up to speed. And um, the one key change is if we were to make government consistent in terms of the way it accepts payments, an electronic payment structure that would be dynamize the approach to the private sector in terms of doing the same thing. And I think if there's one significant blockage, it's government. Okay. Um, you know, and you, as, and, as on that note, you know, you end there and you said that, you know, one significant is, is government. Um, Michelle and, and John, you know, you, you are part of this. Why is it so difficult to get this done? Is it cultural, administrative, legal? You know, why does this take so long? I can, I, can take a, I can take a response to that, Balraj. And, um, I wouldn't say how to put it. I wouldn't say it's a, a, a difficulty. And I want to put that into the frame of context, right? You need to, and, and again, this, you know, even coming from the private sector and, and looking in, right? When you think about government, you, you have to sort of juxtapose it to be a very large enterprise, right? Government has 80,000 employees. You have various ministries, which you consider as various departments and so forth. And just like any business, right, if you are going to change the way that you do business or you're going to modernize a particular aspect, there's a, a transformation pathway to do that, right? And when we look at where we are right now, and I'm talking about the digitalization of payments, at least for the IFC and what we are doing, and some traction has, has been done, right? So, you know, back in 2018 or so, so the Registrar General Department was one of the first government agencies to actually receive online payments, now, the, the biggest challenge has always been in terms of government by volume, you know, is the sort of largest revenue earner, right, in terms of payments of taxes and so forth, right? So the volume of revenue that comes in, right, that it's, it's a huge reconciliation challenge, right? And having the appropriate systems and processes to treat with that, because obviously when you're talking about reconciliation, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars, and majority of that being transacted in cash, so the transformation has sort of been taking place in the background, making the requisite um, amendments, because there's no secret that, you know, our, a lot of the, uh, the, the legal infrastructure that we have in place is very antiquated, and, and there's a lot of amendments to sort of make it fit for purpose. You know, recently, the Electronic Transactions Act, that was looked at, and that was also sort of amended. We had the Audit and the Exchequer Act, which was also amended to allow government now to basically leverage these EFT solutions. So the foundational work has sort of been basically completed and it's all now about implementation and, and rollout. So you will be seeing, you know, there's a lot of work happening right now with a number of different government agencies to receive that. But again, the challenge is now more of a practical side and setting up for the appropriate reconciliation. Okay. So we hear a lot of Michelle, you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, so I know that John looked at and I, I always say there's two sides of the coin and so much that's really going on in the background. So we're he, he, he spoke to the regulation and what's happening. But another part of the coin, as we always say, um, if there is no demand, there is no viable product, right? So a part of us, as he mentioned earlier on, in terms of looking at financial inclusion, we're also looking at understanding the barriers. Because so far, for, for let's say Trinidad, even for the Caribbean, there are sometimes products that come on board, but you're not seeing that level of demand or uptake by the users. So we're really looking at understanding what are the barriers from the individuals themselves. So if we look at the latest FINDEX data based in, um, from the World Bank, we can see that 81% of individuals in this country would have a bank account, right? But again, when you go back to usage, it's not going to be the same. So it's really understanding why one of the elements is trust. So we're seeing if trust is a problem, 29% of individuals without a bank account indicated they didn't use these services or they didn't want a bank account because they didn't trust the system. So you realize that education is key and that's also one of our key pillars is also about educating so that individuals will also feel comfortable to utilize the services. So just add that. So Gregory, from your experience in the region and so on, you know, how far would you say we are away and, you know, from becoming a modern financial hub? Um, which is, you know, one of our goals. That's a bad question. Doc, you say the, the most difficult one for me. Okay. Um, I mean, there are very varying degrees of uh, having a modern digitized economy, right? So so if you look at some of the more developed markets in Europe, you would see that that and, and, and Asia, you'd find that they operate a cashless society, almost cashless. 
right? They've tokenized most of their products and services um, and, 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 and by a subscription model. So if you're, if you're going to work, it's on your mobile device, you're not paying for a taxi, you're swiping your, swiping your cell phone to get on the tube, uh, get off and get on a bus or, or tram. You know, it's all that entire, it's taken one line of transportation has been digitized. If you look at food, entertainment, financial services, the same thing. So the easy, easy, easy comparison to look at that in the real world uh, and real apl- application of it, and then look at what's happening in, in our own market. Um, you know, how much of how much of, of our daily lives do we um, use electronic and digital tools to be able to transact and transfer the value? And it's, it's not a lot, you know. And 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 Michelle did raise a point about the level of adoption. So we do. So I do recognize that rolling out. Um, the, the most um, modern financial products and services using the best digital technology. Uh, and you basically pull up with the Rolls Royce and then no one wants to get in because they don't trust it, they don't understand it. So there, there is a the barrier in terms of knowledge and um, adoption rate. But I, I believe that um, you know, it requires bold moves. So if, if for instance, um, to get a driver's permit, it's, it's, it's done through a digital means, so you have to do it. And then you have a uh, digital ID um, a digital, you know, get a unique ident- identifying indicator for, for all of the all of the uh, citizens, and um, it, it drives the population in a particular direction. And then you'd find that the ecosystem will start to develop around that, and, and the activity will start to take place. And then we will we will see the opportunities to to move the rest of the real economy in line with what's happening in the rest of the world. Okay, so Mr. Brown, you want to pitch in on any one of those uh, area or? Again, your mic is. All right, sorry. Um, I, I'll go back to, to Mr. Outridge and, and, and Dr. Salani, um, if only because I've had a little exposure. Um, bottom line is, is very simple. Um, demand with no product, very very simply. The, 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 the large volume of transactions that the country have done commercially. Right? And just let's look at one, one spirit. So you talk about the ability to reconcile. Well, well, those are things that you have to do. Those are the, the realities of putting in any system. Right? And, and front-end what you, front end and back-end reconciliation. And there are automated tools to do that. Banks do a, a, a but significant volume in terms of transactions. And we have, we have automated tools in the background to reconcile the accounts. We, we, we have matching entries. We know exactly what is out of place, what is allocated or not. So it's really about, it's about system design. So system design start off, but you must start off with the intention that this is what I want to achieve. And if we look at our tax payment structure, which is a classic example, the first point where everybody sort of interacts, we presume we want them to pay tax. Therefore, we should make it as easy as possible for them to pay tax. So let's look at, let's look at the attempts that we've, we've, been, we've been through um, over the course of the last um, six months. Um, didn't come as any surprise. We've been in lockdown for what, 19 months, all right, somewhere thereabouts. Um, we know that there's a deadline, for example, for receiving electronic, um, or there was a deadline for, for receiving um, TD4s, all right? Now, what is the new deadline? We've moved from March to September, all right? Six months late. Um, so what does that do to the old tax system? And that's a, that's a question of inadequate planning. All right? I mean, that, that ought to have come to no surprise. Similarly, with regard to receiving tax payments, uh, the whole, whole method that we have in terms of uh, registering, for example, to to go online to pay your tax. I mean, that's one of the easiest things that we should really put with. That's something we, we, we're supposed to need, all right? So it's something that you ought to, you put, you, you will get the bang for your buck where you put your resources. That's one of the realities we have to pay. Now, I take the point that we will have pockets of a population, and I'm sure that Dr. Salani's numbers are correct, and that in terms of our surveys, but I'm sure that those surveys are about individuals, not about corporations. Am I right or am I wrong? Oh, okay. So I just want to pivot to a, a couple of questions from our, our audience. I want to question relates to uh, the whole idea of uh, digitization and fees and so on. Uh, and maybe I can start with you, uh, Gregory. You know, one person is asking you that, you know, uh, what is the approach that you intend to do? To, to how do we make digitization of payment transaction inviting and affordable for the SME sector, which seems to be keen to adopt this um, technology. Well, I mean, the SME sector is an important driver of the economy. Yeah? I mean, um, that's the, the bedrock of, of our society. And, you know, we would, 
any any uh, country and any economy survives on having commerce take place at that level, support support the entire economy. So the ease and speed of, of transacting uh, with the SMEs in a digital format is certainly going to improve the turnover of, of the currency, uh, speed of speed and efficiency of, of transactions. The when when that increases, when the technology enables it, um, it will facilitate uh, lower customer transaction costs uh, naturally. So right now, uh, a lot of transactions may have digital channels or interfaces. Customers engage with the, the market digitally, but behind the scenes, it requires a lot of manual processes. So uh, Mr. Brown is right. You have to map out the, the steps and the processes. Um, you know, it's a, it's a re-engineering of the process flow aligned to the customer journey because it, uh, it comes back to what we're trying to achieve for the customer. Uh, when you when you do those things and you then you then automate some of the back office processes, you you reduce the volume of of, of hands touching the execution of the transaction. The transaction cost comes down. Transaction cost comes down. Then the SME market will be able to uh, transact in a much faster, more efficient way, more more cost effective way. And um, and then both the SME and the financial institutions can redeploy those savings into offering other products and services. And and, and 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 the entire system uh, improves and the standard raises over time. Okay, so you know one of the burden questions we have always been faced with, and you know it's coming front and center now is the whole idea of diversification. Um, for the start of this in two thousand seven, you know when this whole idea of this financial services and PTIFC was born, that was one of the idea. Um, and I'm throwing this out to the panel as a whole. To what extent would you say that? Um, Toronto Tobago could still develop a competitive advantage and financial services could be uh, a part of a way for diversifying um, the economy. This is open. Yeah, I could um I could jump in here to something that's recently would have been observed, right? Um, and this is even prior to me coming into um the TTIFC, right? And as I was mentioned here, right, in terms of the the new skills and capabilities that financial services companies are looking for, right? So due to COVID-19, a lot of the companies and a lot of you know, large corporations who would have built their sort of center of excellence across the globe, primarily in India and in Manila and in those jurisdictions where obviously you get uh, access to a lot of talent at a good rate, right? They would have seen that supply chain being disrupted because, as you would remember, you know a lot of the, the the pandemic really sort of raged in India at a point in time, and that created, um, you know, a, a definite sort of impact to a lot of companies who had their sort of um, offshore centers domiciled there, right? And the conversation as of recently, and you you've, you have been seeing it, and even coming into the IFC, you know. A lot of those international offshore firms are really now taking stock of their resiliency models, right? And they're, re they're recognizing that, you know, it's no longer about having all the eggs in one basket. We need to look for different natural opportunities, particularly as it relates, relates to financial technology and technology-related skills and so forth, right? Um, and Trinidad, actually, you know, that trend is happening now, and you're seeing even regulations changing around the globe, China. Um, from their particular and the China Bank perspective, they have also sort of restricted their regulation. So you have companies who are operating in that jurisdiction. They're now looking to, to exit and, and set up operations in a more friendly environment. So there's a lot of changes happening globally that we can take advantage of. And the idea is that being able to position ourselves, because again, we're trying to locate the geography. You know, we, we are a natural sort of near showing facility for North America. And definitely for some of these companies in Europe and so forth, right? Because, you know, the, that's a, to, to end on a sort of, you know, economic note, you know, you, where you may pay 200 US per, per hour for a skilled sort of technology developer. And the comparison of that in, in India is between 40 to 50 US. You could probably get that resource down here in TT for 100 to 125 US with a higher quality, you know? So again, there's that real sort of, opportunity that we need to really position to take advantage of because it's not only Trinidad looking at this sort of opportunity but recently if you realize Jamaica has sort of taken a, a heavy-handed approach towards it as well where they would like to establish a technology innovation district 
And it's something that they're working with the IDB because, again, they would have set up the, the BPO sector, the call center services. There are about 400,000 people in Jamaica that's employed in there, and they're now looking for that opportunity in the higher value technology services. So the opportunity is there for the Caribbean. It's just to see who can capitalize and reach first. Yeah. Mr. Brown, Mr. Phil, any? Well, I, I don't, I don't, um, I, I mean, I accept we could look for some opportunities, but the reality is that our population size is uh, a huge um, limiting factor. Um, you're talking about, uh, um, I assume that the middle class and the well-educated well middle class in, in India is 350 million, right? And you're, so still, if you're talking about a percentage of 350 million, you're still talking about a high number. If you assume as a, on our, employ, in our employment category, somewhere about 600,000, well, you know, there's some sort of limits to, to how, how, how far we could go with that. Uh, and it has been tried. In fact, it was tried in Barbados. Uh, just around 2000, just around the, the, the explosion with regard to um, the, the changeover, what was likely to take place. And the, the idea was that they brought a whole set of programmers in from India at technically cheaper costs, and they were supposed to, you know, basically explode. It didn't. It, it imploded for a couple of other reasons. But I, I think that the, the, the are, I mean, the point is that we have to develop certain capacities ourselves, and we have to spend some time on that. If that helps us to develop those capacities for what our economy needs, I think that's it, that 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 is useful as a transition device, as a business uh, with long-term sustainability. I don't see it um, because it's it, 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 it's it's a margin business. It's a thin margin business, um, and a thin margin business for which we don't have one of the key criteria, which is volume. Right? Yeah, how many thousand? How many thousand people can we put in that particular sector? I think how many how many call centers we have in China at the moment? Three. Maybe four, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> not a lot. Um, so that, that to me is a limiting factor. I think that the critical issue for us is the, is the, the, the sort of, of changes from a, from a teaching point of view, a training point of view, a skill set point of view, um, to put the sort of levels of discipline that require us to transition away from the existing payment structures that we have towards a, a more robust electronic payment structures. Um, in our own case, um, uh, and, and we were talking about what's the cost of that. The, the, the standard payment, um, the, the businesses bear this cost. The businesses bear the cost of, of doing electronic transactions. Right? And, and the cost of an electronic transaction is transparent to the purchaser. He's spending, if he's spending $100, he's spending $100. Right? The, the SME, the business, he's collecting somewhere between um, $96.50 and, and, and probably $98, depending upon volume. And that's best. So he's, it's costing him roughly um, between four dollars per, uh, or, or if you want, you know, four cents per transaction, right? Yes. Now the cost of that is really how efficient does that make me, and that that is that is critical issue, and that is one of the, that's a critical sort of measuring point in terms of making our businesses issue. To what extent are we offsetting um, the transaction value, the ease of doing business, with regard to the internal cost that we could share? And that's a break-even point. I don't think we spend enough time looking at it uh, in terms of working it out and therefore making it a selling point uh, to say that uh, it, because it, it's, it's more efficient, it speeds up business, uh, therefore we save costs, that there's an advantage in doing it. I think we've, we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, it's, easy, it's easier, right? But there's a, there's a quid pro quo. I think we need to spend a little bit more time in terms of examining and selling that particular point. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Michelle, you know, one of the, and I'm seeing some questions related to this in, in the chat area and so on. And, and this is a burning question here in the TET and in the Caribbean, the whole idea of exchange, um, foreign exchange and the availability of foreign exchange and so on. Uh, to what extent could uh, these new technologies and banking as a service and payment platforms and so on assist um, in in, in that area of easing financial services and, and foreign exchange and the whole? Well, I think um, that question in terms of foreign exchange earnings, again, comes back to the point I was just discussed, right? Uh, one way in terms of expanding your system, bringing individuals in, that's one way to bring Forex into to foreign direct investment. Um, so that will obviously help ease burdens once um, our system is up and running and, you know, 
we are bringing in more individuals here to invest. Another is that, I mean, while we look at the size, the scope, the scale of business within the economy, we look at Trinidad and Tobago, but if I look at it as a Caribbean region, I increase my expansion scope. And uh, we do have local fintechs, we do have locals with ideas. And again, we know that with scope will reduce their operating, the initial operating cost. And there is that possibility that they can get business outside of the country with the products that they're offering. So again, through the development of our own local system, our own local ecosystem, our own locals, we know that they can, as we have seen, you know, we, are, we have fintech companies that are getting business now in Grenada, in Jamaica, you know, so the potential for that is not just within our economy, but allowing these, um, these firms to be able to extend outside of Trinidad and Tobago and to have that, that wider reach. So I think that is one way in which we earn, as well as we know with the ease of accepting payments, we also see the number of sellers being able to just have their business online, right? You no longer have to only depend. I, I have a product and I, and I put it on. On TikTok, you see the, the younger individuals saying that they know that they're actually making money that way. So again, it's a way of diversifying and, and earning for an exchange. Okay, so you see it as a means by which you can uh, access global markets and so earn foreign exchange in the traditional sense. Now, uh, Gregory, I want to pivot to you to, to pivot that with your pan point. But before I get there, I, I just want to raise a question here that was raised by Kevin Shepard in the day. And I'm going to read the question here. He said, you know, most people... I know in the space say that the bank have uh, no chance. I've got this attitude when it comes to partnering up with common fintech providers to bring about product innovations. What do you think is the cause of this? And do you predict it would change in the near future? I, I would like to respond on that. I mean, as I said, even from my experience working with a number of financial services companies throughout the region, I wouldn't say it's uh, no thanks, we got this. To be quite honest, it's please come and help us, right? Because their core business is not technology. Their core business is banking, is insurance, right? And the model has always been, you know, you are bringing in a specific capability that's going to take me X amount of time to bring to market. If I can partner with you and acquire that and, and I provide the support and infrastructure that you need, it's, 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 it's a win-win. The challenge has always been, as I said, and even Michel bringing that point, right, in terms of, you know, the maturity in which of certain providers, and, and this is where we need to get them to, it, in, in terms of incubating particular ideas and talent and getting them to that sort of scale where they have that robustness that they could work with some of these mature institutions, right, because by nature, financial services companies are heavily regulated. So here you have that sort of, you know, um, dynamic in terms of you have fintech companies, which by nature are designed to be very agile, very quick to market, you would not have all the bells and whistles and the robustness, but then having to partner with somebody who is very heavily regulated, right? So I think that is always the catch-22 with that arrangement and finding the perfect balance. But, uh, you know, I, I, I would say that I don't think it's, uh, we got this, it's understanding the relationship and then understanding what value and finding the, I would say for the fintech, it's, it's, it's a very good time to be a fintech right now in the Caribbean because you have a whole host of partners who will want to work with you once you could bring that value to them. To that, yeah. I, you know, but usually we see the small startups and the agile, uh, very dynamic individuals and firms being able to um, do that. You know, so Gregory, you know, say like a firm like yours, you know, um, do you see, you know, how, how do you see you playing in that space as, a, as an established player? Sure. And John gave some really great points. I mean, when you have large financial institutions that are heavily regulated uh, with, a, with a responsibility to, for the safety and security of the deposits uh, that, that it, it takes in, and then you have a startup fintech that is unregulated um, to, the, to this extent as the uh, bigger players, naturally, you're going to have to go through a few barriers and tool gates to be able to interact in a, in a free way with the large institutions. But having said that, and that's where the benefit of creating uh, sandboxes to be able to bring in the fintechs and have the, the large institutions play in a space that is commonly regulated to ensure that transactions are executed, uh, maintaining confidentiality, um, uh, anti-money laundering rules, as well as not move, creating a new form of risk into the major mainstream uh, banking network. So naturally, and it's going to take some time for everyone to get a com comfortable with the playground and um, more rules, less rules over time, 
it's going to come down, the buyers are going to come down and there's going to be more interaction. Yes, it's a great time to be a fintech because it's all part of creating that ecosystem. And, and all of the large players, um, both in banking and insurance and other sectors, are going to want to interact and have relationships with the fintechs because this is how you create a seamless customer experience. And at the end of the day, customers have a choice. Uh, they have they want to get the best bang for their buck and they're, they're going to go where there's the best experience. Now, taking it home a little bit, and I try to stay specifically away from banking too much today and um, because there's a lot going on under the hood. Um, but what's, what, I, what I will say, though, is that, um, you know, a lot of the financial institutions growing up over the years would have built legacy banking platforms um, that have been robust and would still be test of time and uh, working well. With the changes taking place, they need, they need to pivot that. And that's going to take a little bit of time. And to interact with the new technology of the fintech, you know, finding a, finding a common space with technology to speak to, uh, to each other, it will take time. You know, in our case, we took the decision to, uh, we're the only uh, financial institution, only bank that's 100% in the cloud. And that was a decision we took a couple of years ago. So everything is run out of the cloud with redundancy and, and security in place. And so when COVID-19 hit, we, you know, I, I, we were able to just put it on, have everybody out of the office um, quickly and connect to, 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 to our networks. And with that open architecture, which was a, a deliberate decision, uh, open architecture, open APIs, open data, um, data storage, we are able to plug and play um, better than the legacy systems. And um, and I expect all the everyone to evolve over time. It's just a matter of time. So I don't think it's a it's a, a matter of banks we've got is covered. Different banks are different phases of that development. And therefore, but I, I think the entire industry is going to mature together including the, reg- the regulators. And I'm looking forward to those, those exciting times to come. Yeah, great. Um, so I've been given the license to take a few more minutes. So I, I want to get into that whole area now of digital currency, cryptocurrency, and so on. So Mr. Brown, I, I know you as a, a, a old batsman in this area. You know? Do you see that uh, the concept of, of money becoming obsolete given these new technologies? No. Um, you always need to have some measure by of, of a store of value, uh, a transaction mechanism. Um, and we have a little issue when the transaction value mechanism also becomes a value in itself, which we can't predict, right? and which is where we are now. So I think there's a lot of shifting and falling out before we eventually get to some stable platform. I think the, 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 the base platform, uh, we're talking about, which is the electronic funds transfer and everything as it goes with that. Um, we haven't really seen the full value of it, certainly in the Caribbean, because we've still been operating it from a traditional point of view. And I think most financial institutions, the banking sector as a percentage of the total transactions being done in the world is shifting downwards, right? It's shifting downwards. Why? Because there are a number of other institutions or near banks that are coming into it. We've restricted that in this in this market. Um, cryptocurrencies, um, when they become eventually commercialized, have the capacity to deepen that that widening of, well, sorry, deepen, but widen, but at the same token to move away the the current concentration that we have in terms of the financial sector to continue the movement away from banking to what we consider other financial services firms. Um, And the the, the real issue with regard to where's the nearest bank, this is what is going to be. The, the or, 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 or telephone. This is the realism, right? right. This, 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 this is this is really what we're trending towards, right? The, the, the bank as your, your telephone as your bank, and right. I think that that is really what we're talking about. So I'm less interested in terms of um, Bitcoin or this coin or that coin than to talk about the actual methodology becoming part and parcel of our landscape. Right, and so that would speak directly into our pan coin that you know that we were so interestingly introduced to with a with a carib. Um, <laughs> so um, you know I I teach a, a, a course in financial innovation um, to people in a number of the commercial banks and I've always thrown that idea off you know when I call it you know why can't we have what we call a carry currency for instance and most of the time the pushback I get is not why it can be done but why it can't be done. Uh, so in that context, um, Gregory, uh, 
let's say this panel here is the movers and shakers in the region. Tell us what we need to do to get your parent pan currency operation. Wow. So, so I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to being um, a uniform means of exchange, an accepted store of value, and um, uh, a method that is trusted. So those are the three things we have to overcome, right? And then obviously our accessibility. And uh, Mr. Brown is right. The thing of your cell phone to be able to transact, store the value in a trusted way and be universally accepted within the region, right? So that's uh, taking those principles together and bringing it down to that channel, which is a mobile channel, to be able to do that. So it's, I mean, to achieve it's going to be uh, require a lot of, of um, work with the regulators and the governments because, for instance. You want to be able to enter, if you're coming from the UK or US and you convert into a, a common digital um, uh, store value, right? Now, that store value should be able to then convert into the digital fiat currency in Jamaica or right. Trinidad or Barbados to pay purchase goods and services there. And then as you ex exit out, you must be able to exit out in the currency you came in. So there are some, there are some challenges associated with coming in and coming out. But the, the principle is that that the whole methodology is by digitizing uh, the payment process, by having a, a larger and more inclusive use of the technology, you are going to reduce the transaction cost for uh, activities within our Caribbean airspace. And that is also going to improve our competitiveness as a region. The experience will be better. Therefore, it is expected that we'll get an increase in volume of visitors thereby increasing our GDP. The data we collect will become more unique to our region. We control the data. There's transparency and rating. The data then helps us to um, move capital in the areas that we can clearly see there's opportunity for, for growth and development. Then ownership of the major flag hotels in the, in the region, uh, you know, will create the opportunity for regional entrepreneurs to provide their hotels, restaurants, and that sort of thing. Capital will start to move in that direction. Some of the equity bases of some of the, the, uh, the hotels, for instance, and I'm giving it a tourism concept here, um, you know, that capital, the ownership will now reside in the Caribbean. So more of that GDP will stay here. So yes, it can lead, and I'm just using one example of tourism, it can lead to a diversification of the region. It can help shift capital, but it's all driven by trust, a measure of transfer, you know, must, must be a seamless customer experience. And there are, there are challenges associated with moving in and out of different currencies uh, because obviously there may be demand for one currency or another. And they, 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 those that are smart will try to get in, get into the one that's more in higher demand and get out of the one that's in weaker demand. So there are some, there are some idiosyncrasies we would need to work out or whether the, the, the coins stay within the region and, and it stays, um, you know, it, it's valued based on, on, on a, a base exchange rate that, that we use. So there are ways of solving that problem, but um, you know I'm looking forward to the future. It's going to be really exciting, and um, there's a there's a lot of opportunity. And I just gave one example today. I didn't want to stay in the banking space, but you can apply this to so many other, yes. uh, other sectors of, of, of the economy. And, and that's great. So I see we coming close to time here. I just wanted to indicate that um, to the audience that you know if we were able to, unable to answer all your questions, um, we would try to have an answer. Um, via text uh, in the GSB blog. So as we draw to our final minutes um, here, and there's a lot of things that I know we can still discuss and ask and so on, but what I would do, I would just ask these panelists um, to give a closing statement, um, maybe a, a minute and a half to two minutes, uh, and then we'll have our, our close. So I will start with uh, Mr. Brown. Well, I, I think that the future is strong. Um, the reality is that we, we are a small player in the world, small geographically, small um, in terms of numbers of people, so that uh, we, we won't be leading the charge, we'll be following the charge. And to the extent to which the international financial system is moving towards electronic funds transfer and a, a deepening of the system, so will we. The point is, how quickly do we move in that direction? Michelle? So, uh, as I say, even if you are late bloomer or last mover, doesn't mean that you always have to lag behind in the financial sector. 
I believe that as we update our legislation, update our infrastructure, build our digital platforms, move to sort of a change management and mindset of our population, I actually see that there is possibility for monumental change. I mean, just a couple of months ago, or, you know, would we ever say that the Caribbean would be the first, you know, have the first countries to have a central bank digital currency? So there is the potential at all times for us to, to move ahead. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I see a question from Brendan King. Um, yes. Who I know quite well, uh, you know, how can the Caribbean banks lower their high operating costs? You know, and my closing statement would be that, you know, we need to map the processes, um, digitize those processes, work with the regulators and government to allow us to digitize a lot of the onboarding and processing of transactions. That will lower the cost by using technology and artificial intelligence, the retail products, at least in the first instance. And that is going to lower some of our operating costs and, and, and allow us to offer uh, cheaper products and services. So we need to focus on, um, you know, moving the needle from a, an acceptance uh, policy, a technology and an education standpoint. And, and if we step in that direction, we will, we will start to see changes taking, taking place in the real economy that will uh, certainly benefit our societies and our economy for the future. And finally, John. Yeah, I, I mean, I will end with, and I think it's the, the kind of closing note, right? It is a great time to be in fintech, especially within the Caribbean. Right. We are, as Michel was saying, you know, it's it's sometimes good to come from behind. You get to see the mistakes that persons would have made and you get to adjust your strategy. Um, I am from where I'm sitting, you know, and again, there are a lot of things happening under under the hood. The opportunity is coming. I think from a local perspective, we have a lot of things that are happening positively. The the financial sector is strong. The as you can see, the IFC's mandate has been adjusted to focus on the digitalization of payments within government. So there's a strong push in terms of getting this done. And as Misha was mentioned, where we really want to start with, and again, you know, sometimes being first, you know, where you have seen the, the Bahamian sand dollar came out to market, right? But uptake has been slow. So we don't want to repeat those same mistakes, right? We want to make sure that we curate specific services to the specific citizens and cater for their need to ensure that once those services come to market, it's cost effective, it's convenient, and it delivers the value that they would want and expect out of it. Because at the end of the day, everything we need to do, and Gregory kept saying it over and over, is to keep the customer at the center. And for on our purpose, it's really about improving service delivery to citizens flat out. Okay. So as we draw to the close, we have had you know, quite a, a, a fair amount of information. So we started by looking at the present system. We saw some futuristic trends. At the end of the day, uh, our panelists have expressed hope and confidence, and this is a good time uh, to be here. At the same time, we have seen that the fundamentals have not changed. The need for financial literacy, the need for trust, the need for confidence uh, in the system. All in all, uh, the financial system is critical for us moving forward. And so the onus is all on all of us, uh, the business school, the private sector, the regulators, the central bank, and bankers in the whole, to ensure uh, that we all get this right, that we all stay connected um, to the global financial system, that we all continue along this path, and that we build a, a nation and a, and a region uh, in such a manner uh, that we are able to get out of you know, all of these different pools in terms of financial systems, in terms of uh, foreign exchange and so on, as we build a stronger uh, global economy and re regional economy. So I would like to thank each of our panelists for the time and the, you know, the effort and your eloquent presentation and your information. You know, I was reading some of the chat and one of the um, comments said that, you know, uh, it was explained, uh, difficult concept explained in a way that simple persons could understand. So I thank you all for that. I would also like to thank our audience on the Zoom, on Facebook, and on YouTube for taking the time. I hope this has been beneficial to you. And I invite you to visit our website, thelockjackgsb.edu.tt, and see what other programs and courses and so on uh, that you might be interested in. And we look forward to seeing you in our future roundtable discussion, and hopefully as part of our program. 
So as we go, please stay safe and looking forward to see you at episode five for this long table business discussion. Good afternoon and thank you all. Thanks everyone. Good times. Pleasure.